I want to talk a little bit more about um, the projective plane and kind of why we're interested in this place to live. Bezu's theorem is uh, a wonderful theorem, but it's a very classical result, and we want to uh, go beyond that. So let's just go into full screen here. So we've got a, a, a universe to live in. It's not the only universe we'll think of living in, but it's a great universe to live in, which is the projective plane. And then these objects within the projective plane, which are curves defined by algebraic equations. So for example, we've seen examples of parabolas, which are special cases of what's called conic sections, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Those are the degree two curves. And there's cubics, when you cube something, that's you know taking the third power. So these are examples of what you could have with a cubic equation. Those come into, these are called elliptic curves, um, or these are anyway, this was a, a little bit different. Um, and those are come up a lot in the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer situation in my other talks. Um, and the degree we've seen is an incredibly important thing. It de determines a lot about the shape of a curve, and in particular, it um, it comes into Bezu's theorem. One thing that about the degree you can see here, uh, a conic intersects a line by Bezu's theorem in two points. A cubic should intersect in three. One, two, three. Here it looks like it's only intersecting twice but there's issues with points in infinity and, and uh, complex numbers that make it a little hard to figure out just by looking at a picture. You can measure the degree of a curve using algebra. That's easy. Geometry, like intersecting the line, or calculus, and I haven't talked very much about the specifics of that, but um, it really has to do with the calculus as well. One of the things that's important here that's going to link up with when we talk about topology soon is that even though they don't look like it, this is the only one that looks like a closed curve that it just starts at a point and then comes around and comes back to its starting point. These guys look like they're open curves. Either it's hard to tell. Does this have an end point? Well, really, it's supposed to go off to infinity. We just can't draw it going off to infinity. But all these other ones look like that either they end or go off to infinity. Well, that's a misleading picture in projective space. In fact, this guy goes off to a point in infinity way off in this direction and then comes back over here. So it actually is a closed curve just like this. And in fact, so does this. This guy goes off to this way and then can teleport back onto here, goes off this way, and then uses another point in infinity to teleport back to here. Similarly for these guys, all these algebraic curves are really closed curves. And a, a nice um, term for that is a cycle when you consider them in projective space. That's one of the big reasons I redid my discussion of Bezu, is that it's really essential for the Hodge theorem to realize that these guys are all closed curves. Um, and they only are in pr if you if you are in projective space. Okay, so here's the idea we, we, we've gotten to. We've created a wonderful universe, a space to live in. Here is the projective plane, and we're going to get more general examples later. But this is really what I want you to think of for most of the talk, to be honest. And then special objects in that space. Here they are certain kinds of closed curves defined by solutions of polynomial equations, and those are called algebraic cycles. Now I want to say a little bit more about the projective plane. Um, I skipped this in my live talk, but it's uh, it's really worthwhile. It just takes a few minutes. Um, the thing about the projective plane that's a little uh, dissatisfying so far is that we took the ordinary plane and we artificially added these points at infinity. Um, and I want to show you how you use uh, how you uh, another way to make the whole plane at once. And it uses three dimensions to create a better version a better creation of the same 2D object. Not really a better object, a better way to create the same object. And this idea of different dimensions interacting is, is really helpful. Again, we've already seen how we kind of want to pretend we understand four dimensions. So let's look at this as a good example of, of going for between dimensions. So here's the idea. We have a light source at point O. Um, and we have a piece of paper. And it can send out light in various different directions. Not in all directions, but it's got a a beam of light, like a laser, shooting out along this purple line. This is, again, due to Dan Freed, is his picture. Um, and another purple line. And we put a piece of paper just in some place in space. And that's the yellow plane right here. Okay, And we're going to get the red dots. Surprisingly enough, a purple beam of light is leaving a red dot. Don't ask me. Ask uh, Professor Freed um, how that works. Um, these red dots are indicating where the beam of light strikes the paper. Okay, So, the idea here is, and this is why it's called projective plane, it's about like projecting um, images onto a piece of paper. And things like perspective drawing have a lot to do with this idea of the projective plane. Um, so the idea is that we are creating points. Our rule is we create a point on the ordinary plane by shooting a light source from this fixed um, place, from this fixed source O, shooting a beam of light from the source O. 
So what if I wanted to understand how do I look at a point at infinity? How do I understand that? It's very natural. Like I could start with a beam of light going up and then to here and then to here and then here, and just change that. And if that beam of light was going horizontal along this green axis, then it's not going to strike the paper at all. It, that the place where the red dot would have shown up has zoomed off to infinity. So we've all seen this, like shooting a, you know, uh, shining a flashlight against a wall or something. If you turn the flashlight so the beam is parallel to the wall, the beam of the spot of light just zooms off and goes off the wall and seems to go off to infinity. So I know this is a very brief treatment of this, but the idea is that you can invent points at infinity by just taking this beam of light and just rotating it to be horizontal. And there's nothing really weird about that. Yes, if it's not horizontal, inter it'll intersect in an ordinary point. And if it's horizontal, it'll intersect, quote, unquote, in a point at infinity. Okay. Another thing that's really, really useful here is that suppose I have these two dots, and I think this is two points in the projective plane. And I'm really interested in these two points. And maybe I'm going to draw a line between them or do something like that. Suppose somebody else comes in with a different sheet of paper that's at an angle in a different location in three-dimensional space. They're going to see the two beams of light intersect in two different points, but it's, but it's the same beams of light. And what they can do is they can relate anything that happens on this yellow piece of paper to another piece of paper by just referring to the fact it's really created by the same be beams of light. And here's the, the really crucial idea. A different piece of paper with different locations for the dots is just a different view, or you could maybe say a slice of the same object. And that's a really neat perspective. Here's a place where that's really, really cool, very classical piece of, uh, of mathematics. Okay. Here's what, we, what is often given in um, high school uh, geometry class as a description of conic sections. And it's really the just justification for this weird word, conic sections. Okay. Um, ellipses and parabolas and hyperbolas, these special curves that we've seen examples of already. The, uh, the claim is that if you take a double cone in three-dimensional space, uh, so it's a cone going up and attached to a similar cone going down, and you cut it with a plane, you can create all the different conic sections by changing the plane. And so I want to show you that in a little bit more of a live fashion. Um, and hopefully the sound isn't cutting out, because I know it cut out last time when I did this. So I'm going to create this in a little bit more of a live fashion, as I said. Um, here is a double cone. So you can see it a little bit better, the red cone, the blue cone there. That's one object. It turns out that algebraically more natural than a single cone. And I'm cutting it with a plane to create an. I could create a um, parabola by cutting it with a plane that's exactly parallel angle of, of the cone, so it'll only intersect one part. And I, uh, intersect, I can create a hyperbola by having something that's a little steeper, so it'll intersect in two pieces. Okay. I'll actually create a hyperbola. So here's how. Um, that's usually phrased in high school. It's that all these different curves are generated by slicing a double cone by a plane. But you might think, this sounds really familiar. Hey, this is, oops, um, right here there's a light source. And the light source is just shooting out beams. They all just have to be exactly the same angle. Like here, it's a 45 degree angle. And they shoot up and down, and it all have to be a, a 45 degree angle. So that's a certain fixed set of light beams. And then different people are bringing their different pieces of paper and getting what they think are different curves. This is the projective plane version of that statement. These are actually all the same object in the projective plane, just different views of the same object. That seems weird to say that a hyperbola, which has these two pieces, and an ellipse, and a parabola, they're really all the same curve. But that's actually true in the projective plane. And remember, I was trying to convince you that, for example, like the hyperbola is really a closed curve because it can teleport from one branch to another using the points at infinity. Well, this is another reason why they really are the same curve. They're all just shadows of this one double cone in three dimensions. Those, that, that pattern of light beams, if you use that to create a figure in the plane, then everybody brings their own sheet of paper and thinks they're getting different curves, but they really are. Um, from a, a projective geometry standpoint, the same object. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, here's the parabola. Okay, that's the same object. Okay, so I want to say something a little bit more about this. Um, I want to talk about rigidity, and that's going to contrast with topology, which we're going to introduce in the next video. 
and flexibility. Here's a couple of, of uh, facts about, about rigidity. Um, suppose I have y equals p of x, and, uh, or I want to look at all the different ways I could, I could create a curve, y equals p of x, y is a, a polynomial function of x, and see how that intersections with y equals 0. And what I've done it, so far is I started out with a polynomial, and then I found the intersections. What if you want to do that backwards? Suppose I say I want the intersections to be right here, 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 and here at x equals minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And um, I want to create that as the intersection of a curve y equals p of x, polynomial function, with y equals 0. The claim, my claim is there's very little choice of what p of x can be. It turns out, again, this is not a very hard piece of algebra, that if you know the intersections of a curve, and you know all of them, and you know their multiplicities, then in fact the only thing you could do is to take one example, like this solid, this dark blue curve, and just either scale it, make it a little closer to the axis, the red curve, or stretch it, the green curve, or flip it upside down, the black curve. That's it. In particular, you couldn't add little wiggles in here. That's just not possible if these are really all the, all the intersections. And remember, you've got to count all the complex intersections, too. Okay? So if you know all the intersections, then in fact, there's very little choice of what the p of x can be. Very little flexibility. You can't just take it and say, well, look, I, I, I I've only have it pinned down here, 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 and here. Why can't I make it do whatever I want elsewhere? Not if it's a polynomial, not if it's an algebraic object. So algebraic objects are rigid. Um, geometry, Euclidean geometry, this, we've been really talking about a very, di a rather different kind of geometry when we talk about algebraic geometry, but I just wanted to point out that al Euclidean geometry is all about rigid motions. That's another name for congruence. If I take this triangle and I want to say, I'm going to keep that essentially the same geometric object, I can slide it parallel to itself, and I could rotate it, and I could do a combination, but I can't do anything else. I can't add little wiggles. I can't bend and stretch things and change angles and lengths within the figure and say, quote, they're the same object. Now, you might think that the contrast here is with projective geometry. I was just telling you that these three are all the same curve. You might think, wow, that's a lot of flexibility. But it's not really. If I start with a degree 2 curve, um, then yes, this is one picture of a conic, that's another picture, that's another picture, and our new perspective is that those are all really the same object. But you still can't put in arbitrary wiggles. You can't just go d -d 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 and redraw something. Um, there's still actually a lot of rigidity here. In particular, Bezu sort of, there's a, Bezu has a really interesting role here, but it, in some degree it says that there things really have to be rigid. One reason I couldn't put arbitrary wiggles into an ellipse is that I could detect that it's the wrong degree by intersecting that with a line, and it'd have too many intersections. Okay, So Bezu says, once I know the degree, it really, really limits what, how it can possibly intersect arbitrary other curves. That means it's got to be really, really special. Okay, If I'm a curve that intersects any line exactly two points, it can't be super complicated. So Bezu should seem at this point like a classic statement of rigidity. It turns out to have some very interesting in relations with topology, which is the, the king of flexible subjects. Um, and that's where we're going to start with the next time, with the next uh, part of this video, this uh, series, is that we've got two basically rigid, essentially rigid subjects, and then topology and calculus turn out to be very flexible subjects. And it's the amazing thing is that they relate to each other as well as they do, and they inform each other, even though they have this very different feel. Uh, but that's where we'll stop for right now.